Hello, and welcome to the Boston Globe Sustainability Week. Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to thank our underwriters for their support. Phillips, our presenting sponsor, as well as the International Business School at Brandeis University and the Museum of Science. On behalf of all of us, we hope you enjoy the program. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the Boston.com Book Club. Our program today is part of Boston.com Sustainability Week presented by Phillips and sponsored by Brandeis and the Museum of Science. My name is Steph Schmidt. I'm the manager and buyer at Water Street Bookstore in Exeter, New Hampshire. Um, we've been around for 31 years and we are located just about an hour north of Boston. So come visit us. Um, and we're here to, today to talk with Keith O'Brien about his brand new book, Paradise Falls, the true story of an environmental catastrophe. Here's my very well-worn galley copy. You can buy yours in hardcover though, a nice hardcover. Um, I also wanna start by thanking the Boston.com book club for including me and also to Paul Swyden of the Silver Unicorn Bookstore and Acton Mass for helping to organize this. And um, thank you all for joining us on this beautiful Earth Day. So um, as we talk, there's a Q&A button uh, located at the bottom of the screen and I'll try to get to your questions as they come in. And um, this presentation is being recorded and will be available after the event. So oh, let me begin by introducing Keith. Keith O'Brien is a New York Times bestselling author and award-winning journalist. He's written three books, including the best-selling Fly Girls. He's been a finalist for the Penn ESPN Award for Literary Sports Writing and has contributed to National Public Radio. He's also written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, and Slate, among others. He's a former staff writer for the Boston Globe and the New Orleans Times Picayune. As a newspaper reporter, he won multiple awards, including the Casey Medal for Meritorious Journalism. He lives in New Hampshire with his wife and two children, and he's one of our wonderful local authors at Water Street Bookstore. Um, he just, I just noticed today that there was a wonderful Boston um, Globe review that came in for the book, and I'm just gonna quote a little bit from it because um, it's so great. Uh, Chris Vogner wrote, Paradise Falls is a gloriously quotidian thriller about people forced to find and use their inner strength. After all these years, they are fortunate to have a chronicler as focused and thoughtful as O'Brien. He brings their courage back to life. And I totally agree. Um, so welcome, Keith. Thank you, Steph. It's good to be here. And thank you yeah. all for, for coming out during your lunch breaks. <laughs> well, Keith, why don't you start by giving us an overview of the book for people who don't, who don't know? Sure. So some folks will remember or, or will recognize the words Love Canal. Uh, but I think most people have completely forgotten what happened there. And so maybe I guess for starters, Steph, I just give a brief foundation for the story. Um, this was uh, one of the great environmental crises of the 20th century. Uh, it was not the first environmental crisis. It wasn't the worst environmental crisis, but it was in many ways one of the most shocking because of its location and because of the, uh, the ripple effects that this, this uh, disaster, disaster created both in US environmental policy and, and in the environmental movement. Um, the, the Love Canal actually at one time was a canal. Uh, this uh, in, the, in the 1890s, a man named William T. Love, who was a bit of an entrepreneur and also a bit of a grifter uh, showed up in Niagara Falls, New York, and he had a grand plan. Uh, William Love was going to carve an 11 mile canal, uh, a cut through essentially, uh, connecting the, the up river side of the Niagara River, just, uh, just above the waterfalls that we all know, to the down river side of the Niagara River uh, on the other side of the falls. And it was gonna be a, a small channel that would create hydroelectric power, uh, and, and he was going to build this grand city, a, a model city at its terminus. And William T. Love made it about a half a mile uh, before he ran out of money and, and, and also just willpower to do the work. And he disappeared. And this canal then sat there, six miles due east of downtown Niagara Falls. For anyone who's ever been there, uh, this is just six miles straight up river uh, from the waterfalls just there on the edge of town. And it, it sat there for decades. And then in the 1940s and 50s, uh, one of the largest employers in town, a company named uh, Hooker Chemical, uh, a very large 
a chemical manufacturer that would one day be acquired by Occidental Petroleum, uh, began using the canal as a dump for its chemical wastes and residue. And it used it for about 10 years. And then in 1952, it, it uh, began having discussions with the city of Niagara Falls about selling the land to the Board of Education. Uh, to be clear, this was a conversation that was started by the Board of Education. Uh, the city was growing in the post-war years, just as many cities were. And the population was pushing east to the edge of town in Niagara Falls as more and more people moved to town to take those chemical factory jobs. And, you know, uh, the, the school district needed new facilities. And uh, they reached out, inquired about the landfill. And after a many months of conversations, and, and, and I should note much hesitation, at least initially from Hooker, uh, they did sell the land to the Board of Education for a dollar, up goes a school, around it grows a neighborhood, a neighborhood of about a thousand families in all, black and white. And, and, and you know, it, 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 these secrets then remain buried, uh, well known by people in power in Niagara Falls, uh, but, but not by almost anyone else, and certainly not by the people who moved to this neighborhood, who bought homes in this neighborhood, who sent their children to that school. And it takes about 20 years before these problems begin to surface in ways that can no longer be ignored. And that's really where uh, my characters, the protagonists at the heart of Paradise Falls begin to fight back. Um. Let's talk a bit about the community there in, in that area, in Niagara Falls and in um, those neighborhoods. Aside from the health problems, it sounds like this idyllic place to raise a family at these close-knit neighbors, this wonderful school within walking distance of their homes, these good manufacturing jobs. They had these great outdoor spaces where the kids played. Um, what was that place like? And then how does that all tie in with, with your title, Paradise Falls? So... Yeah, I mean, this was a desirable place. This was a working class neighborhood, but it was a working class neighborhood where people were buying that first piece of the American dream and scraping their way to the middle class on, on factory workers' wages. And, and so, you know, the homes there were small. They were all ranches, no, no uh, two-story homes, all single-story ranchers, two, three bedrooms. And then there were also... Uh, public housing um, just on the downtown side of the canal. Uh, about 250 to 300 families lived there. And, and this was, again, desirable public housing, not uh, a large, you know, red brick building, but rather uh, clusters of townhomes that had been built by the city specifically for families, for, for families uh, with, you know, three or four or five children. And so, People had moved there, uh, you know, to to either get that piece of the American dream or 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 find a better home, and and many of them had moved there because of its proximity to that school right at the heart of the neighborhood on this big swath of rectangular land that had really never been fully developed, which was sort of curious to people. Um, and and so back to the title, you know. Uh, and, and Steph, you know this, uh, certainly, you know, you write a book that has like a hundred thousand words in it and, and then you spend with your publisher and your editors and your publicists and various folks, you know, hours and hours and hours talking about two or three or five words that are ultimately going to be your title. And, you know, I didn't want to call the book Love Canal or even really have it in its name, because I feel like if you lived through it, uh, you have this shorthand feeling of uh, idea of what it was that's maybe not accurate. And then if you didn't live through it, if you're younger than, say, 42 years old, you might not have ever heard of it at all. And, and then the term is sort of weird, like Love Canal. What is that? You know, so I really knew from the outset that I wanted to do something here that was more than just the headlines that people may remember. And, and I think if you do remember it, you think about the headlines of the disaster and the toxic waste coming out and, and people essentially running from their homes. Uh, and 
I wanted to capture it as it really played out, which was this place that people wanted to live and then, and then it having it all fall apart. And so, um, you know, uh, you know that, that sort of brought to mind this idea of paradise or a suburban paradise. And, and then, you know, the, the title itself is a bit of a, you know, a double entendre. It's like, you know, it's paradise falls and, and then sometimes paradise falls. Yeah, it really works. Um, let's, let's talk about the, um, the chemicals that were found there and what were some of the, the health repercussions that people suffered. So hooker chemical, or, or I guess to step back for a moment, for those who don't know, in, in the middle part of the 20th century, Niagara Falls was a hub for chemical manufacturing. Uh, it, it, many companies had moved there uh, to uh, harness the power of the river right there. Uh, you know, flowing through, and also the salt deposits that were were naturally in the ground there. So uh, there were many chemical companies dotting the landscape up and down the Niagara River, really between the waterfalls that people know and this neighborhood was just a stretch of, of, of chemical plants. Um, and, um, and, and Hooker, uh, you know, was one of them. And uh, they were they were very profitable and and um, very successful. Uh, they had they they, they specialized in, in many things, but I'll mention two in particular. Uh, they created in, in great volume some weapons of war. Uh, in particular, uh, they produced uh, something called thionyl chloride. There now that uh, compound that chemical isn't going to ring a bell for most people, um, but people will know what thionyl chloride was used for. It's the fundamental element of mustard gas, uh, the poison gas that Hooker uh, generated in great volumes uh, during World War I and, and after it. And, and, and that is buried in part in, in the old canal in that landfill. Um, the, the other thing that Hooker produced a lot of uh, were various pesticides, and insecticides, or rather the compounds that would be used for the pesticides and insecticides. And, and those also ended up uh, in the canal in, in, in great volume, the, the wastes and the residues. And you know, there's some stunning uh, scenes that are in court depositions and, and legal documents that were produced much later where Hooker employees recounted uh, being out at the canal in the 40s or early 50s and watching these trucks roll up, uh, especially on a, you know, a Monday uh, you know, after a, a long weekend or a long week of production, and it, it, they'd just be loaded down with 55-gallon drums of chemical waste. And, and, and at times, they were sort of just dropped helter-skelter into, into the canal you know, buried anywhere from eight to 25 feet underground. And, you know, Hooker knew that some of these chemicals were, were volatile, uh, in particular, thionyl chloride. Uh, it was known to react violently with water, which of course would end up in the canal or would already be in the canal when they were dumping these drums. And so at times the workers recalled actually puncturing the drums uh, on the truck bed, uh, perched over the hole in the ground before dumping them, uh, and, and, and then uh, pushing it in and watching it sort of bubble and, and boil out because they didn't want the water to seep in to these drums over time by accident and then have something happen beneath the ground. So they thought it was better to pierce them before, before putting them in the ground. And then again, you know, and I, I think, you know, especially even for me, having lived inside this story for so long, sometimes you, you fail to recognize the absurdity of what we're talking about here. Then later, this land is, is sold to the Board of Education um, at where a school is built, you know? And so I think the thing that um, I, I began to recognize about this story and the thing that I think is so relevant about this story for today is that it wasn't just one poor decision that led to the problems in this neighborhood. 
but a litany of poor decisions by multiple agencies and entities over time. Of course, Hooker, but also the Board of Education, the City of Niagara Falls, uh, you know, multiple poor decisions over time that led to the problems. And then equally as powerful and relevant, I think, is that it wasn't just one protest or one angry letter or one angry phone call that turns the tide in this neighborhood, but two years of such things, you know, a concerted effort by ordinary people and ultimately a legion of them uh, that, 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 forces the change in, in this neighborhood. And that I think, you know, you know, is, is an incredibly relevant tale for the, for, the, for the world we're living in today. Well, yeah, let's talk about those incredible women. Um, Lois Gibbs is really the, the person who, the woman who really started everything. And she's so incredible. Um, she was kind of complicated. There was some, she, there were some divisions in the neighborhoods um, surrounding her work, um, but she accomplished so much. Why don't you tell us about how she got involved and in, in her um, results? Yes, I know you love Lois Gibbs, Steph, uh, <laughs> and, and lots and lots of people do. Um, you know, it by 1980, uh, just for reference, Lois Gibbs had become one of the most famous or notorious citizen activists in America, and uh, and it began purely by accident. Um, in 1977, Lois Gibbs was uh, 26 years old, and she was a mother of two kids uh, on, on, on the east side of Niagara Falls. She lived on 101st Street, two blocks to the east of that school and that playground, that old canal land, which, of course, she did not know about. And, you know, she was a factory worker's wife, stay-at-home mom, a housewife, as they would have said at the time. Uh, and, and Lois actually had barely graduated from high school. And, and she was um, self-conscious about that. She um, you know, was the kind of person who stayed quiet at teacher conferences or PTA meetings. She, she didn't want to speak up and, and have anyone think that you know, she wasn't smart enough. And, and, and then in you know, 1977, uh, her, her oldest child, Michael Gibbs, begins attending kindergarten at that school in the neighborhood, you know, and she, you know, uh, like any mother uh, would do, you know, walks him there on, on their first day, you know, and um, is very excited about, you know, uh, her son being in school. Uh, and by Christmas that year, Michael Gibbs, previously healthy, is now suffering from seizures. And, you know, the doctors, you know, tell Lois that sometimes this happens. And, and it's true. Sometimes it does. You know, uh, even doctors today will tell you that, you know, um, uh, a child suffering from seizures might just be idiopathic, meaning we don't know what causes it. And, and they put him on medication and, and, and she begrudgingly accepted this uh, diagnosis. Um, but in the spring of 1978, Lois begins to read small stories at first in the Niagara Gazette. Uh, which reported that uh, state officials were looking into some chemicals that had been buried in the ground in the heart of her neighborhood. And Lois at that point does, you know, what mothers do. She begins connecting the dots to, you know, what's happening in the outside world, what's happening in her house. And, and at that point, she does what, you know, any uh, parent might do. She makes a modest request. Uh, Lois goes to the school district and she asks that based on what she's reading in the newspaper and her son's recent diagnosis, uh, she asks that they move him uh, to a different school for first grade in the uh, September 1978. And, you know, I often wonder how this story might be different or this history might be different if they had satisfied that request, but they don't. Uh, they tell her the school is fine, the land is safe, and uh, her son's seizures are probably the result of something else. And uh, at that point, Lois is angry. And, and she begins to go door to door in her neighborhood, gathering signatures on a petition. And the petition at that point is just, uh, uh, again, rather modest. Lois is asking only to shut down the school until they can learn more. And so she is stunned uh, on August 2nd, 1978, 
when in Albany, uh, the top health officials announce that not only are they gonna shut down that school, they're going to recommend evacuation for uh, roughly 200 families around the old canal. And then they're gonna actually a few days later order evacuation for those families. And Lois's house is, is on 101st Street just outside that first evacuation zone, just our seven other, 700 other families. And, and now everyone is wondering um, you know, where to draw the line where the risks really end. And that's where really the fight begins. And, you know, as, as people can imagine, this is an incredibly stressful time that begins to unfold for the next two years. Um, you know, I, I used to be a reporter in New Orleans and, and I covered Hurricane Katrina and the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina 17 years ago in New Orleans. And, you know, in the in the wake of, of of that disaster, which of course was you know an, uh, in its own way an environmental disaster, um, families fell apart, uh, spouses got divorced, people committed suicide because they had lost everything, or they were trapped in their homes, or they were worried they would never get their money out of their homes. Neighbors at time turned on neighbors in New Orleans, you know, in two thousand five, two thousand six, and. That happened here, you know, at Love Canal. And so, you know, multiple factions begin to emerge, uh, you know, as people try to escape their homes. Uh, and, you know, Lois Gibbs is leading one of them and, and in some ways draws the most media attention, uh, in part because of who she is and in part because of what she does. And, and that earns her fame and notoriety, uh, allies and also foes. Um, why don't we talk a bit about the the sort of racial and economic that divide that was between the neighbors? There were some home, there were homeowners, and there were also renters, as, as you said, that and they were all affected by the situation, but they had really different perspectives. Um, some of them couldn't just up and and move. Um, how did that the sort of differing perspectives affect how they organized and how it was handled? So, uh, you know, if you imagine this neighborhood as a sort of a, a, a large rectangle, you know, to the east and to the north, uh, there, there were homes and there were also homes to the west, but there was on that western edge, uh, these, um, this public housing development that I mentioned, it was called Griffin Manor, uh, home to about 250 to 300 families. Uh, these are uh, working class folks, white and black, who had moved to the, the, this public housing development uh, because they had multiple children. And these townhomes really were built for that purpose. And you know, in 1978, when Lois Gibbs is beginning to connect the dots, uh, so is a woman at Griffin Manor. Uh, uh, her name was Aline Thornton. And Aline was a, a black woman and, and a mother of, of six kids. And she had spent most of her life at Griffin Manor. Uh, Aline had spent the tail end of her childhood there and then moved away and then returned to raise her own kids. And um, uh, when she begins to read what's happening, Aline, uh, she also begins to connect it to what had happened in her life. Um, her, her third child was born in the 1960s. Uh, it was a boy, his name was Gregory Thornton. And Gregory didn't even live to his second birthday. Um, he died of leukemia, which again, idiopathic. We don't know what causes it, but Aline uh, you know, begins to wonder if perhaps the chemicals that people are now discussing buried in her neighborhood might have had an effect on that. And you know, the, the homeowners and, and the renters, and I, and I do hesitate to use that word in, in the book or even in, conversation because they were residents, you know, they were people living there too. You know, these children all went to school together. They played on the same little league baseball teams. This was actually a very diverse neighborhood by 1970s standards or even modern day standards. And, you know, but the, the, the folks in Griffin Manor and the homeowners, uh, you know, failed to, to come together uh, and, and, and primarily for two reasons. Uh, Certainly, the, the crisis at Love Canal, just as any economic crisis, 
every, uh, every environmental crisis, uh, almost every societal crisis in America sort of uh, peels off the, the, the underbelly uh, of the neighborhood and exposes the, the prejudices that existed there uh, quietly beneath the surface for years. And, and, and that was certainly a, a part of it. The other was just a failure to understand the situation. You know, the homeowners were invested in their homes and had everything in them. And again, these were not wealthy people. Uh, they were they were factory workers, and and they were obviously naturally concerned about getting their money out of their homes, getting their mortgages paid, or getting bought out. And and homeowners believed that the the folks in Griffin Manor could just move away, uh, and you know they didn't understand that for someone like Aline or or many of the other families there that that really wasn't possible uh, because there wasn't public housing that existed for a family of six or if there was an apartment in one of those other public housing developments in the city of Niagara Falls it wasn't as safe or as nice as Griffin Manor and so there was sort of a disconnect there um, you know but to me, what, what became obvious as I, as I you know, dug in on this research is it wasn't just about people at Griffin Manor arguing with homeowners. Homeowners argued with homeowners. You know? Everyone was arguing with everybody. You know, at times, there were four or five different groups that emerged you know, fighting for different things. Some people didn't even want to leave this neighborhood and actually would make that case. So it was it was a very complicated and stressful situation. There was no perfect solution. So it, it wasn't like they, you, they could say, we all want this one thing. It, yeah, it was so complicated. But as Lois Gibbs will say today, and she is still alive, and, and she did spend uh, the, the, the next 40 years working uh, in environmental justice uh, and, and, and consulting with other people around the country about how to solve these kind of problems in their neighborhood, you know, as Lois says today, if they had come together, if the homeowners and the residents of Griffin Manor, if everybody had presented one argument and had found a way to do that, she, she believes they would have escaped their homes uh, much sooner, all of them. Yep. Um, another character that um, is so, her story is so heartbreaking is Luella um, Kenny. Why don't you talk um, a bit about John Allen? Um, it's it's just it's such a heartbreaking story. Um, and then how she became involved. So Luella Kenny is uh, another uh, prime protagonist in, in the book and a key person historically in this story. Um, just like uh, Lois Gibbs and Aline Thornton, uh, Luella was a mother and she had three boys who uh, uh, lived just north of the old canal lands, the playground and school. She was a 10th of a mile to the north of it uh, on a street called 96th Street. And they lived in a, a little elbow turn in the, in the road there. Uh, and, and their house uh, had a much larger yard than most others. It, it sort of backed up into a confluence of creeks on the northern edge of the neighborhood. And, you know, uh, uh, in the spring of 1978, uh, Luella is aware of the issues uh, at, the, at, the, at the land. But at that time in the newspapers, um, it was still being written that it was mostly an issue on the southern edge of the neighborhood, which really was like a mile away from Luella's house. So she wasn't that fixated on it. It was just sort of background noise. And, and then uh, John Allen, uh, her son, begins to get sick with a mysterious set of symptoms that uh, local doctors you know, can't cannot solve, cannot decipher. And, you know, I really, in my early research for this book, as I started to track down folks who were still alive, and I, and I did an early interview with Luella Kenny, um, I recognized the importance of her story and her family's story here. Uh, you know, it, it didn't get a lot of press in the late 70s or early 80s when, um, when this was unfolding in real time. You know, this was, again, for folks who remember it, this thing was like a snowball rolling downhill. And, you know, uh, it was just like one crisis after the next, after the next. And little 
uh, little but tragic stories like the Kennys just sort of got swept up into that snowball and, and rolled right past. And, and so, you know, I, I did phone interviews with Luella about what happened to her son, what happened to her family. And then I went to her house uh, in Western New York and Luella uh, still lives in Western New York. She, she's about um, 10 miles away uh, from, from Niagara Falls now. And Luella, like a lot of the uh, important people in this story, kept everything from this time, um, records and documents, but most importantly, Luella kept her family's medical records from this time. And I'm talking about hundreds of pages of medical records. And, you know, it was really in Luella's dining room in her, in her home in Western New York, um, going through these medical records that I realized that I was going to be able to bring this whole uh, this whole time in her family back to life on the page. And, 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 and that's when I sort of felt in my, in my core that Luella and John Allen and, and his struggles and, and his fight here will really be the, like the emotional heart of this story. Mm. Um, one of the things that was so impressive was the, the citizen science that the women did to to collect the research in the neighborhood um, and to document the health problems. Um, why don't we talk about how they collected their data, but also kind of more importantly, how it was discredited. So uh, the, 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 the women uh, were assisted early on uh, by a woman named Beverly Pagan. Uh, Beverly was not a resident of the neighborhood. Uh, she lived 25 miles uh, away um, and, and, and she worked in Buffalo. Uh, as a medical researcher uh, and, a, and, a, and a PhD level biologist. Um, but maybe just as important, Beverly Pagan was a mother. And, and she had specifically done research in the 70s that connected environmental uh, hazards to human health. Uh, Beverly had done studies uh, suggesting, again, scientifically, that smog and air pollution contributed to lung disease and asthma. Uh, she did other studies that suggested scientifically that cigarette smoking uh, might just be connected to cancer. And um, uh, so, of course, when these problems emerge in, in Niagara Falls, a short drive from Beverly's lab in, in Buffalo, she goes out there and Beverly starts running her own tests. And Beverly begins to believe uh, pretty early on that the problems and the risks uh, extend much further than state health officials are saying at the time. And, and, and this puts Beverly Pagan in a difficult position uh, because uh, the, the medical institute that she works for in Buffalo is affiliated with the university at Buffalo, SUNY Buffalo State University. And actually her medical institute technically falls under the umbrella of the State Department of Health. So, you know, Beverly is a state employee and actually an employee of the Department of Health. And so when she begins to make statements, first privately, then publicly, that uh, she believes the risks are greater than folks are saying in Albany, she is directly contradicting what the top health officials are saying in, in, in Albany. And, and um, she begins to pay a price for that. And, and she knows it's happening. Uh, but she still continues to assist the residents. And one thing they begin to do is run their own surveys, run their own epidemiological uh, data gathering operation. And they begin to believe that uh, this problem can't be hemmed in by a street map. You can't evacuate based on streets because chemicals don't care about streets. Uh, you have to think about how the chemicals might have traveled. And, you know, going back to when this land was still a ragged waterway, an abandoned canal in the early part of the 20th century into the middle part of the 20th century, if you look at aerial photographs of that time, a series of stream beds, some of them quite large, cut through the canal, crisscrossing it north to south, east to west. Some of these stream beds were actually like 
20 feet wide, eight feet deep. You know, a child could stand in them and be dwarfed by the size of these stream beds. And, and in fact, there are photos of that. Uh, and, and they began to believe that uh, there were clusters of health problems that followed these stream beds or swales as they were known. Uh, and uh, Lois Gibbs and Beverly Pagan began to call it the swale theory. And they gathered data that, um, that found clusters of problems around the swales. And they presented that, Beverly did first, uh, in a private meeting in Albany in November, 1978. And when she flew there for this meeting, she believed that she was going to be uh, uh, heard out on this. Um, she wasn't coming uh, you know, to, to, to create a problem. She was coming to say, I have additional science that I think might add to the conversation. And uh, the health officials listened to her that day. The meeting lasts all day. And, and then in the next day's papers, the top health officials who had been so um, uh, conversational the day before uh, reject this data in the newspapers in quotes that they would have given as they left the room that day. And, and one of the things that they say uh, about this data that the women have gathered is they call it uh, useless housewife data. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's stunning to think about that now, just the, uh, the misogyny and the chauvinism of that statement. Uh, but, you know, Beverly in particular wore it like a badge of honor. Uh, and in fact, at a, at a later hearing uh, that she would attend uh, with state officials, uh, she wore a badge that had her name and it said expert on useless housewife data. That's amazing. Yeah, she's quite the hero of the story. Um, to move on to sort of the, the solutions and the kind of political issues, um, why was this such a huge test of political will? Like, it seems like here's a problem, let's fix it. But it was such, it was such a journey to get there. Mm. What happened? <laughs> well, it was unprecedented, you know? I mean, uh, a chemical landfill buried in the heart of a neighborhood uh, around which a school and a playground and houses and a public housing development have been built, it's, it's unprecedented. Um, and, and it was going to be quite costly. And also, to be fair to the health officials who were wrangling with this at the time, no one knew where to draw the line. What, what level of risk is acceptable? And, and where do you draw that line? And by the way, those questions, what level of risk is acceptable and where do you draw the line? That's an issue that health officials and environmentalists and residents of far too many communities are still wrestling with today as we deal with other issues related to chemical contamination or PFAS contamination, the, the, the so-called forever chemicals. So those questions are very hard to answer uh, in any kind of definitive way. Um, because when it comes to issues of chem chemical contamination in particular, or pollution in particular, even smog say, it, there's no direct line of causality. You can't say very often, you, why one person's health problems exist. Is it because of the chemicals that are buried in the ground, uh, you know, a half mile away or 300 yards away? Is it because of uh, the PFAS levels in their well water? Or is it just a thing that happened? And so, you know, state health officials and then federal health officials are wrestling with this problem. And then, you have an issue of liability and ownership. You know, uh, you know of course, the, the Board of Education believed, you know, Hooker was responsible and Hooker believed the Board of Education was responsible. And, 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 and here's this orphaned site, essentially, that was put there decades earlier. And, and so it leads to multiple things, but among them uh, in Washington, uh, just as Beverly Pagan is starting to meet with state health officials in New York and say, just as she's beginning to say, I think the problem is bigger, uh, EPA administrators in Washington are beginning to say the same thing. But they're not thinking just about the issues in Niagara Falls at Love Canal. Uh, they do a, a, a tally, a tabulation, 
of how many other orphaned hazardous waste sites there might be in this country. And they determine it's hundreds, hundreds of them that predate the EPA. Because remember, the EPA didn't even come to existence until 1970. And so, you know, they're now going back through records and saying, my goodness, we might have 600 of these. And so they begin to push in the fall of 78 and then into the uh, spring of 1979 for new legislation. And these EPA administrators, uh, lawyers and environmental scientists actually begin to build this legislation for, for a, a large fund of money, a super fund, some began to call it, that would give uh, the EPA authority and also a financial uh, power to come in and clean up these sites. And of course, you know, as, as folks will know, uh, the Superfund, you know, legislation is ultimately passed as a result, really, of, of the resistance at Love Canal uh, and, and has still, for better or for worse, shaped uh, the U.S. response to hazardous waste sites for the last 40 years. Um, a, a number of the questions that came in from, from audience members are, are sort of grappling with what can people do about, about issues today? Um, and are there toxic, you know, um, berry toxins that you've discovered since then in other areas? Um, there's a lot of PFAS issues around here, or around where I am in New Hampshire. Um, so I think people are sort of saying, what lessons can we take from Love Canal and from the work that Lois and all the people did for today? So sadly, you know, as, as those questions indicate, we're, we're still grappling with our own problems today. And um, just a couple weeks ago, I did a story for the Washington Post about the PFAS issue, the forever chemicals. Um, for folks who don't know, these are chemicals that are very prevalent in everyday products. They're used um, uh, for, to, to increase durability and, uh, and also um, uh, make things stain proof and waterproof. They're in your pans, uh, they're in raincoats, they're in your uh, shoes or uh, jackets. Um, and, and, and they're also in wastewater, PFAS is, uh, because there's so much PFAS being used over time. It's turning up in wastewater, it's turning up in wells, it's turning up in the ground. And, and they call them forever chemicals because they don't go away. They don't dilute by and large, they aren't soluble. And, and, and so once they're here, they're here. And my story for the Washington Post was about a, a farm, actually, an organic farm in, in rural Maine, in Unity, Maine, um, where uh, the, the young farmers, a couple in their 30s, uh, just learned over the winter that their well, their soil, and indeed, some of their crops were contaminated with PFAS, again, on an organic farm. And they had to piece it back together with the help of the state of Maine to realize that this problem actually was put in the ground there and, and may, maybe uh, dozens or hundreds of other sites in Maine 30 years ago when uh, uh, mun municipal uh, treated sewage, essentially biosolids is what the industry calls it, was used as as uh, fertilizer on on the land, uh, and and you know uh, unfortunately for it, for this farm uh, the the one of the districts where they got that uh, that fertilizer the the old treated sewage uh, was was Waterville, Maine, where there was a large paper plant, uh, and 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 by the way, and many paper products, paper plates, paper bowls, they're made with PFAS. And, and so, um, you know, now in Maine right now, they're wrestling with this massive problem of PFAS contamination and what to do about it. And back to the original question, you know, what, what can we do? Um, you know, I, I've spoken to a lot of environmental, uh, a lot of environmentalists and activists and, and also lobbyists over the course of this research, both from my book and my recent story. And, you know, there's a tendency, I think, for all of us at times when we look out at the world and the things that are happening to sort of throw up our hands and, and, and say, I, I, I just, I can't stop it or I can't change it. And I think what I take away from the story and, and, the, and the protagonist at the heart of, of my book is that 
the only way to change anything is with persistence and resistance again and again. Um, the, the big things and the little things, um, you know, the, the, the attending of marches and protests, but also the, the, the lobbying and, the, and the, the activism through normal political channels. In the history of the United States and in, 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 in US environmental history, almost no changes have come from the top down. The changes, whether it was the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act or the EPA or the Superfund Act, or just the attention that various sites have gotten over the years has almost come from the bottom up. Yeah, the, the reality of, of all of the pollution, it's so bleak, but this, is, this story is so inspiring. Um, so I really thank you so much for bringing, in, um, bringing it to us. And I think we're at our time. Um, I think there's links to buy the book. We, are, we have signed copies at um, Water Street Bookstore. The link is waterstreetbooks.com and Keith is always happy to personalize. So you can put a little note in saying if you want him to, to sign it to the you know, environmentalists in your life. All right, well, thank you everyone. Thank you, Keith, so much. This is great. Thank you, Steph. And thanks to boston.com and thanks for everyone to, uh, for coming out on their lunch break. It was, it was great to have this conversation. Thank you.